All right, we're good to go. Sounds good. Um, so y'all should be seeing my first slide. Can I get a confirmation on that from somebody? Yep, I can see it. Perfect, okay. So another thing too, um, Joshua, if you would let me know if at some point um, you start getting a lot of like bandwidth issues or lag or something like that in my audio, just let me know and I'll uh, go in and turn off my, my camera and see if that helps. Okay, sure. So, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, so we're going to cover not a whole lot of breadth on iNaturalist, but we're going to basically cover the things that I think you would probably need to know if you were starting from the basics um, to get you started on this project. So if you are not familiar at all with iNaturalist, never fear, you're in the absolute right place. And if you are familiar with iNaturalist, then something to maybe think about is if there's some little tips or tricks or things like that, that, you know, you hear from my perspective, or if you have questions about things that you um, would like answered, please feel free to share those. But all to say, we'll get you all set up with um, hopefully the information that you need in order to successfully participate in this and other projects. So that said, um, one of the things I always like to be able to start with is why this kind of work matters and why these projects are important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of why we collect these observations and the things that we can do with them, especially in particular through the iNaturalist platform. And then we'll just dive right in. Um, so I'm going to start with basically a few things uh, for settings for any of you that are fairly new and have just signed up within the past you know, month or so or never, haven't signed up yet uh, for an iNaturalist account. Just a few little things you may want to check on for the long term. Uh, and then we'll start talking about making observations and how then to join projects and then share your observations with those projects because the adopt loop trail is very much like the Nature Shockers projects that we have that are long-term in that it's a traditional project. So it's set up a little bit differently than some of the projects you guys have may, may have seen with, for example, City Nature Challenge or the Pollinator Bio Blitz. So it works just a little bit differently. Um, so we're going to talk through some of that. And then um, because, again, the digital this whole digital thing, virtual thing is, is a lot, but then also what we would do if we were in person is we're going to take a little break for those of you that want to use it as a break. Awesome. Uh, but for those of you that want to do a little bit of practice outside, the weather here in lovely Austin is fantastic. It's nice and sunny outside. So hopefully wherever you are in the state, um, you'll be able to at least kind of take a stretch break and get outside and make a few observations. I've actually created a test project, a practice sandbox project for today so that you can feel totally at liberty to, you know, play around with this. Don't worry about, you You know, have to worry about messing up the actual project or anything like that. Um, so we have a kind of a, a cool little sandbox to play in um, when we do that. So we'll kind of take a, a bit of a temperature read on how we're doing on time in terms of how long that break will be. And then we're going to come back see if any folks had any questions or issues or things like that that we need to address, and then talk about how you may want to go in if you need to edit your observations, how you would go in and do that, and then also how you can kind of close this information loop and go back in and help make identifications on other people's observations. So we're going to keep it pretty focused on those things. So why does this kind of work matter? Um, so you'll notice if you have looked at the Adopt-A-Loop trail that it makes reference to our Texas Conservation Action Plan. And this is actually something that is really a cornerstone of a lot of the work that we do across the agency. And certainly for the Nature Trackers program, this is something that we're very invested in as well. And it really is something that drives a lot of the community science work we do in general, and in particular, a lot of the projects that we have set up in iNaturalist. So this is uh, our plan for Texas. Every state has one of these that is set up to address what are called species of greatest conservation need. There are over 12,000 of these nationwide. And currently on this list, we have over 1,300 in the state of Texas. And this is a living document that gets uh, updated periodically uh, at least every 10 years. We're actually coming on another um, period of time where we're looking at revisions for this document in the next few years. But what this 
term means, if you're uh, looking at species of greatest conservation need, is you're essentially assessing how stable their populations are over time. So a lot of the species that you'll be making records of are species that we would consider to be fairly common. Maybe some of them are actually expanding their range. Maybe they're kind of going through the normal cyclical ups and downs that species do. And we're not necessarily worried about their conservation status. But for some of these species, their numbers have been in decline for some time. In some cases, they may have experienced very sudden declines um, or changes in range and uh, shifts in kind of abundance. And so that kind of pattern may be the thing that alerts us that something is going on with a particular species or population that merits extra conservation attention. And if your numbers as a, an organism dip low enough, then you may position to be eligible for listing uh, as threatened or endangered at the state or federal level. And so all of those species that are threatened or endangered are considered species of greatest conservation need but not all of our species of greatest conservation need are to that point where their situation is that dire. Our goal with this is to catch them before they get to a place where they're in such dire straits and put those species back on a path to recovery. The other reason why species may end up as listed as greatest conservation need is if we don't have enough data on them. Of course, in the state of Texas, with the amount of private land that we have, this is a, a real challenge that we deal with. And so one of the really important things that we do with community science is it's a way for us to help fill some of those data gaps. So what we'd love to find out is for some of these question mark species that we actually have a lot more of them represented on the landscape than perhaps we knew about, in which case maybe they are much more stable or uh, expanding their range in ways that we hadn't known about previously. So that's uh, another consideration that we have and another reason why this work is so important. So as I mentioned, we have over 1,300 of these species of greatest conservation need, and hopefully you will be encountering some of these as you work on this and other projects. Some of them are, in fact, critically endangered species like the whooping crane, some of them are game species. Some of them are iconic, uh, well-loved Texas species like the horn lizard. Uh, and some of them are things that have a scientific name, but no real common name, like a lot of our karst invertebrates. So one of the things that we do with the Nature Trackers program is focus on these native species with a real goal of collecting information on those species of greatest conservation need. And we do that in a broad way through iNaturalist. It's really well set up to do this. So if you've ever interacted with our programs before, you'll know that we have some projects that are kind of place-based or BioBlitz type projects like the City Nature Challenge, things like that. We also have this other class of projects called, that we refer to as our taxonomic projects, these long-term projects that are referred to in iNaturalist as traditional projects. And this is the same type of project that the Great Texas Wildlife Trails Adopt-A-Loop project is. So it's pretty much works the same way as our long-term nature trackers projects. So if you've ever uh, joined one of our projects and shared data with it, then this should be a pretty easy thing for you guys to, to kind of ease into. But there are a couple of little things that we're going to talk about, like additional fields. Um, so this is some of what we have in the project right now. So we were just looking at kind of the main page there. Um, so there's already observations added into this project. So it'll be fun to see how this goes. So the advantage to using this type of project, some of you may be thinking, well, why don't you just use like the BioBlitz collection type project where it just adds our stuff in automatically? So one of the things that's nice about this is rather than scooping everything up, it's a lot more selective. So we get the observations that are very specific to the site. And it requires that a subset of people join the project. So in order to share your observation with the project, you do have to join it, which means that we have people that we know are actually participating directly in this initiative. And if you happen to have a species that has been automatically obscured. So for example, if you find a box turtle, that is a species, that group of uh, organisms in Texas, our box turtles, are automatically obscured and iNaturalist. We'll talk a little bit about what that means. 
that basically means that if it's not something that we made an observation of or that shared with the project, we can't see the true location of it. So by adding those observations into this type of project and requesting that you share that location data with us, we get the exact location of those types of species as well. So that is something that does not happen with those collection or BioBlitz projects. So that's another advantage to this. Um, you can even make observations private if this was something that was being done, for example, on private land. So these are wildlife trails, so it's a little bit of a different situation. But those are some of the reasons why this was a kind of a better fit for this type of uh, project. So one of the things that we're hoping to be able to do with these types of projects in iNaturalist is find information um, that is important for management and in a broader sense also looking at uh, using some of those observations for species of greatest conservation need as inputs into our natural diversity database. So this is something that's managed through the wildlife division and it's basically our database of record for occurrences of different uh, what we call tracked species, so species that are kind of of highest priority to help us uh, get more information for conservation planning and research. And so our biologists put data in here, contractors put data in here, researchers that we fund put data in here, or we add it for them. And we want to now kind of create a pipeline to get high quality, robust community science data in here. So some of your observations that uh, end up in this project, or if you share them also with our Nature Trackers projects, could also be doing extra work by helping to support this database. Um, so a couple of examples of how we do this. So we have a Nature Trackers project, Herps of Texas, that we've been pulling data from for a couple of years now. We have 77 out of those uh, 262 species that we're really interested in. And we've got over 4,900 records that have been added to or updated in the natural diversity database, all thanks to community science. So this is pretty exciting. So there's a lot more that can be done with your observations beyond the immediate applications of betting what's happening with the wildlife trails. So just know the possibilities are kind of limitless and it's really pretty cool how um, your observations can work for multiple different purposes. So before I go dive right into iNaturalist, does anybody have any kind of bigger questions about some of that stuff? And we can save stuff to the end too, if it's something that y'all don't want to put out there right now. And if you guys want to just hit the, the raise hand button, I can unmute or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, so I'll be listening for, so yeah, Joshua, just if you see that at some point, just please ju jump in, because literally right now, like, I can't see anything on Teams. <laughs> it's all it's all PowerPoint for me. Okay. So, so that said, um, let's talk about iNaturalist. So this is really um, a pretty cool platform. If any of you are new to this, I'm expecting that probably most of the people on the call have some experience with using it. But if you're looking to recruit more people, which I hope you all are, um, to explain it in really simple terms, it's part social network, part biodiversity database. As an observer, you go out and you make an observation that is anchored by some kind of photographic evidence or sound recording. When you share it through the platform, it uploads it to the iNaturalist site and other naturalists in that network can see it. And then a discussion ensues based on that evidence that you provided about what was seen. In some cases, it's really a, you know, pretty clear cut. Uh, if you've never uploaded a picture of a Northern Cardinal, feel free to try that and set a timer and see how quickly the uh, confirmations on that ID come rolling in. It's, it's like people playing whack-a-mole, it's kind of fun. Um, and other times, you know, a really cool discussion kind of ensues about something that might be a little bit of a mystery. So you have the ability to kind of call on this larger network in order to help with these uh, identifications. So a few things to kind of keep in mind about what we're actually collecting. When we make an observation in iNaturalist, we're creating a digital voucher for the presence of an organism. So when you make an observation at one of these uh, wildlife trail sites, you are only saying that the organism I'm 
recording is present. It doesn't say anything about the presence of other things or absence of other things. Um, so it's a really good way to build a species list and get a sense of where on the landscape these different organisms are distributed. Uh, it does not measure absence, so we don't have a way of recording zeros, so to speak. And it's really not set up to measure numbers. So if we're looking for data inputs that give us numbers for population health, we go to other databases to get that information. But iNaturalist is really, really powerful in building that list and getting a sense of where those organisms are in the landscape. Another thing, some of you may be mostly familiar with this platform through the phone app. And just know that there is a whole website out there that backs this up uh, with much, much more resource and detail and is absolutely worth your time to investigate if you haven't checked it out before. Uh, so the most recent numbers, we have over 56 million observations globally in this database. And Texas is holding steady at about 7% of that global total just from within the state of Texas. So we have a huge potential and you can again see why with this many uh, active users and this much coverage across the state, why this can be a really powerful tool to get out into some of these locations and update and verify and build out species lists for what's actually on the land. So one of the things that we're hoping to be able to do with the observations that come in is get them to research grade if at all possible. So if you look on the website at any given observation, at the very bottom, as you scroll down the page, you will actually see this chart on every single observation that is the data quality assessment. And this will tell you basically if it has all of the information that it needs in order to be research grade. So one of the important things to note is to fit into this designation, you have to have provided some kind of photo or sound file with the observation. This was actually when I first used iNaturalist, nobody told me that. And so I was a little mystified about why none of my observations were making it to research grade. So that is one of the key things. The other thing that's really important, and this may be something that you again encounter as you're collecting data for this project, is research grade specifically applies to organisms that are wild. So you may be encountering some species that appear to be captive or cultivated, and primarily we're going to be talking about things that are cultivated. Um, so this will be plants that have been installed. They can be native plants, but perhaps they're outside of their range. So a great example of this is the red yucca, widely used in landscaping. So you may be finding this in places um, where it's not actually within its native range. But that kind of information is important to know as well. So if you do encounter some of these and they do get added to this project or any other project in iNaturalist, it is very important to flag them as captive or cultivated because that designation can be really, really valuable to those researchers who are out there who are interested in studying, for example, how wild native plants are actually being uh, distributed outside of their range and cultivation. Uh, so just know, uh, you know, you can see here are some of the images on the side here that all of these red yucca have little signifiers in the background of the images that kind of clue you in that these are actually um, cultivated. When you flag something as cultivated, it changes that status automatically from either being research grade or uh, needs more needs ID to being casual. And that is very important. So. Um, just know if you do encounter any observations for things that look like they're planted in a garden or something like that, um, feel free to go in and give it that tag that basically says this, uh, this looks like it's captive or cultivated. Another thing that people often don't necessarily think about is um, dead stuff. And this counts in iNaturalist. Um, putting in deceased organisms is data. So... For example, if you happen to encounter roadkill along some of these routes or at different um, locations, that can be a really, really powerful source of data for species that are very cryptic or that we often don't encounter. And it's unfortunate, you know, when we find them that in that state, but it's also a very important note, signifier that those organisms are in fact present on the landscape. So. That said, we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit into some of the nuts and bolts of iNaturalist itself and talk about a couple of things that you may want to check on if you haven't signed up or if you're about to sign up for an account. 
So accounts in iNaturalist are free. All you need is a valid email address to, and you come up with a username and a password. And if you are signing up, one thing to check on is what the default time zone is that shows up on uh, your computer or your device. Because oftentimes what we found is that a lot of people end up with a set to a different time zone. And if they do participate in an event like a bio blitz or something like that, or even it's just annoying on their own observations to have a different time stamp on them that doesn't necessarily sync up with central time. So uh, do just note that that is something that, that we've actually had issues with people not having data included in BioBlitz or time bound projects because of that. And I'll show you where you can get to that setting if you already have an account or if you just wanna double check it. So what we're looking at right now is the website. To get to a lot of your profile settings, you're gonna wanna go into the website to do some of these. So just know uh, if you're on the website, you can get to a lot of information pretty easily that's related to you from the top menu here under your little icon. And this will take you to your dashboard. Another thing to note is that you can uh, send and receive messages and get notifications from other users in the community. So this is something I don't believe you can actually do through the phone app. I've never gotten notifications when people message me or not seen where it shows up. But this little, let's see if my mouse will show up. This little mailbox icon here is how you can direct message people. Uh, unfortunately, you can only direct message one person at a time. You can't send it to, to two or three users at a time. But uh, just know if you want to do that, the, that you'll want to go do that through the website. And you'll get notifications about who's uh, interacting with your observations or observations you've interacted with. So for, to get to some of your settings and check on things, um, again, go into the website to your dashboard and you'll go to your profile tab. And what you'll see here is kind of the information that everybody can see. And underneath where your picture would go, there's a button there when you're logged in for you to edit your account settings and profile. Uh, so for example, if you need to update your, your email address for some reason, you can do that there. If you want to change a password, you can do that there as well. And this is where you can go in if you need to adjust your time zone or change it. Um, below, you'll also see the ability to set a default place. So I find this to be really, really handy because the larger the place that is your default place, the longer it takes for observations to load on the website. So if you really want to kind of focus in on a county level or something like that, then this is really, really handy. All of our counties in the state of Texas are pre-populated as places in the iNaturalist, which makes it really easy. Hey, Tanya, I, we've got a, a question from Greg and Sally. Okay. So... You're on a website, is that correct? We're yeah. we're on our phone, so your interface looks totally different than what we're looking at on our phone. Absolutely, yes. So okay. right now, I am showing screenshots from the website, so um, through Chrome, but in PowerPoint. And that's one of the reasons I want to show this because I don't believe that um, I'm working only on iPhone and. Uh, I don't believe that through either Android or iPhone, you can get to all these settings through your phone. But people have questions, so that's why um, just letting you all know where you can find this stuff. Any other questions? I don't see any other hands raised right now. Okay. So one of the reasons I wanted to show this is because of the setting down here. So if you go through your profile and you scroll down on the website, um, in that page, there's also an area where you can control project settings. So this applies specifically to those traditional projects. And you'll see the question here, which projects can add your observations? So what can actually sometimes happen with, certainly with our Nature Trackers projects, we have teams of curators that actually help out with these projects. And they may um, add observations in that so I am notoriously bad for forgetting to add in things like milkweed to our Milkweeds and Monarchs project. And the curators are really, really on top of it about pulling those in, I often go back and I think, oh, I forgot to add those. And then when I go back an hour later, 
one of the curators has already pulled it in because I've given them permission to do so. So on my project settings, for example, I have it set to say, projects can add my observations for projects I've joined. Because I've joined those projects, I'm willing to share observations with them, but not any old project out there. So this is one place where you may wanna look at how your settings are um, defaulted if you are interested in participating in a number of different projects and you're wanting to kind of control that a little bit. Another thing that I wanna point out that you can do through the website is let's say you have a bunch of observations that you forgot to go in and add a particular piece of information to and you want to do a, an edit for a batch of observations. So rather than doing them one by one on your phone or something like that, or even doing them one by one on the website, when you go into your dashboard view like this, you'll notice that in this gray banner up here at the top, there's a little thing that says your observations, and that's very handy. But here in your dashboard, there's another tab that I've got highlighted for observations. And when you go into that, there's a button here that allows you to get into a system for batch editing. You cannot get to that from this gray menu up here at the top. So just note, this is a little kind of um, shortcut here that lets you get in and you can, for example, if you need to add a batch of things to, to a project and you forgot to do that, this is the way you can quickly go and do that. Or if you need to add, for example, an accuracy number, um, forgot to do that when you added things in, you can go in and do that there. And the last thing I wanna point out that's part of your dashboard is that it's a quick way to check on the projects that you are connected to. So if you have started any projects yourself, those will show up there. And then projects that belong to other people that you've joined will also show up on this list. So it's a quick way to quickly get to those projects if you want to go check in on them without having to go through the search function to find them. So, so any questions before we move on to adding observations? I'm not seeing any hands being raised. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about adding observations. So many of you guys may wanna get out there with cameras and that's actually my preferred way to do observations. Um, and if that's the case, then you're gonna to wanna to upload things through the website. So we're gonna start with the website. So what we're looking at right now is, it. let's say you'd been out on a, on a you know, great day and you have a whole bunch of pictures that are on the SD card of your camera and you are ready to get those into iNaturalist. So I typically go through my photos before I open up iNaturalist and you know, anything that needs to be edited or cropped or you know, things like that, or just bad photos that need to be deleted. Um, I'll go ahead and do that first and then open up the website and get ready to pull things in. So when you log in, it'll take you to this default uh, page and there's a nice big button there for add observations. And when you click on that, this will pop up and this should look very similar if you have ever used Dropbox or Google Drive or anything like that. It works exactly the same way. So Typically what I'll do is I'll have on my screen, I'll have you know the website kind of fit to one side of my screen and then my pictures and the folder on the other side and I'll literally just drag them across and pop them in. And when you do that, it's nice, you'll get a little uh, thumbnail showing you what the photo is, that's your primary photo. If you wanna add multiple, as we all should, if we have something like a plant, you're gonna definitely wanna have multiple photos of that organism and you will drag them on top of each other. And then you'll see underneath the photo that a little number will show up and say, it's photo number three of five that's in that particular observation. So each one of these little placards here, if you will, is a single observation. And you can have multiple photos associated with each. So once you've got those pulled in, um, for most cameras at this point, we should be getting time and date location, if, or excuse me, time and date. If you have GPS enabled, then it will automatically pull that location information in as well. In this case, my camera did not have that. So the first thing that I may wanna go in and do is look at uh, giving it an identification. 
So one thing that you can do through the website, since you're automatically connected to the internet, if you don't quite know what you're looking at, or um, you know, you leave your cursor in there for just even a few seconds, it will start to ping the computer learning algorithm, computer vision that they are building and have built for this website that basically relies on all the identifications that that community has made. So every time a human looks at an image and says, this arrangement of pixels to my human brain equals this organism, the computer vision program is learning. And it's using that information to refine those algorithms. And then what it does is it turns around and makes suggestions for you about what your photo might be. So in this case, it says, we're pretty sure we have a grass. Here's our top suggestion. And lo and behold, that is in fact in Lone Oats, which is pretty darn cool, right? Um, so you can go through that process. If you find, oops, I've accidentally put two photos of the exact same organism next to each other. I need to put them in. You can actually combine, select and combine. You can drag and drop as well to combine things. You can also select all. So let's say I was ready to put in location information. These all came from the exact same point. So you may actually have this experience at times. I can select them all and my geo privacy, I'm okay with that. I can set that to public. And then I can go in and set a location. So it pulls up a map and I'm gonna search for general area. These all came from Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And when I select that, it takes me to that general area. But this is a pretty big area, 271 meters. I can do better than that. So I can zoom in and drag the circle to change my accuracy. And now I've got it where I want it. It's about four, four meter accuracy. So that's actually really good. And it's prob that lines up with what, uh, you know, where I know myself to have been on the site. One of the things I do want to point out, please be as accurate as possible in this measure. Even if your, if your camera has a GPS, um, I actually have a Nikon Coolpix, it does not automatically fill this accuracy field in for me. This is something that I do have to do manually. And in some cases, I can select a whole bunch of photos and say, you know, if I'm photographing a plant, then I can kind of give it a general, you know, relatively tight in accuracy and know that that's, you know, if I kind of look at what I'm seeing on the map and say, yeah, that's pretty, pretty good. I can add those in batch. Um, one organism where I don't do that, for example, is birds, because my distance is going to vary to them based on the bird that I'm seeing. And I said, try and estimate that for each one that I do. So this may be a place where you do have to do a little bit more work, but please do add those accuracies if you have an estimate for it. Um, one thing that we sometimes find people do in general, and iNaturalist, who are not familiar with geo privacy, is that they'll often set a huge accuracy. I took this in my backyard and I don't know, want people to know where it is. So I'm gonna set a you know, 10 kilometer circle. That's just creating fuzzy data. So if you're concerned about privacy, we have geo privacy settings that can be invoked instead of messing with that accuracy. So please do add an accuracy in and keep it as tight as, as you feel is appropriate to the observation. So I mentioned geo privacy. Um, that has three options in iNaturalist. Your default probably for most of what you do is gonna be open. Uh, basically, this gives you a nice pinpoint on the ground. You can see that pinpoint. Everyone using the platform can see that pinpoint. Uh, if you're dealing with a species that's considered at risk, or if you decide you want to create an area of uncertainty around an observation, for example, if it's in your backyard or something like that, you may choose to make it obscured. And what this does is it shows kind of a random point in the general area where you were. So you'll get a general reference. You'll know, oh, this person is from probably this general part of the county in this part of the state of Texas. And that helps with context. Um, if you, for example, have some really compelling reason why you wanna make something completely invisible to uh, the general public, then you can go with private. But just know that when you do make something private, it makes it very difficult for people to even find those observations. That said, uh, this is something that the projects are very helpful with us uh, in managing. So if you have a private observation and you share it with one of these curated traditional projects that we run, we'll still be able to see that location information, even though the general public will not. 
So a couple of organization, a couple, excuse me, of examples here. Um, here we have a box turtle. This is obscured. So we know that because we have a little circle and the square of uncertainty. And when we click on the details, it actually tells us why the coordinates are obscured. This taxon is obscured by default because it's considered to be at risk. And we have obviously concerns about coll illegal collection for this, this particular organism. In this case, we also have another obscured organism, circle with surrounded by a square of uncertainty. When we click on the details, in this case, the geoprivacy is obscured because the user, the observer, has chosen to obscure it. So you can actually get a little bit of information, or if you've done this yourself, you can verify that your setting is how you want it. When you make something private, so this is one of my personal observations. I'm logged in as me. I see my pinpoint. If I log in as another account or just look at it in, on the website in general, this is what I get. Absolutely no reference information whatsoever. Um, so no location information to other people, but the problem is this takes away any of that geographic context that people can use to actually help identify the organism. So it's, it's a double-edged sword to use private uh, as a geo-privacy setting. So again, for those of you that are new to the system or have never used that, I did want to lay that out there and just let you know that you do have options available to you, but there are caveats with each. Um, if you do make something private for some reason, uh, a thing that I like to do is put in a general location information in the description that at least lets people know roughly where this was seen. So in this case, um, which county in the state of Texas so that they can look at the squirrel and say, okay, that identification of rock squirrel actually makes sense. So that's a little bit about geo privacy. And that setting again is right here where it says location is in this case, default is public. You can change it to obscured or you can change it to private. So the last thing that I want to talk about here, so we've got our location is set, our IDs are entered. Um, We've added a comment here that maybe we have a large stand underneath a tree, and now we're ready to add these to a project. So once you've joined the, the official adopt -a loop project and you go into add observations and you go to this drop down menu, your, that project will show up in this list. So it does not pull up every single project on the website. It will pull up only the ones that you have joined. And then you can select that. And then the next thing you want to do is be sure to go in to the fields. So it's not just joining the project. There is an observation field that you are asked to complete called place of observation and the site number. And so again, you'll be able to access that and fill it out right here. And once you've got all of that done, then you can go ahead and hit submit and that will upload it officially as a saved observation to the site and to the project. Um, so those are photos that we've kind of talked about. You can also do audio files. So if you have calling frogs or bird song that you want to share um, with the project or any other projects, you can do that through the website if you're working on an iPhone. Um, unfortunately, you cannot upload sounds through the iPhone app right now. They have, however, updated the Android app so that you can actually do sound recordings in the app if you wanted to, or pull a sound off of your phone and add it into that observation. So for you have a few couple more options with Android, but the kind of the way that I generally do it is make a recording on my iPhone, add it to Google Drive through my phone, and then when I get on my computer, open up Google Drive and pull those sound files onto my computer and then pull them into iNaturalist. So it's a little bit of a process. So any questions on the website and that process of adding things before we move on to the phone apps? I actually have a question that I, I know has come up before. And is there a way to put previously observed things from your account into a project? Yes. So we're we're going to talk about that. So okay. we have, yeah, and I th I think we're going to talk about that. When we talk about editing because once you've made that observation and you want to go in and oh, actually we're going to talk about it before. We're going to talk about that in joining projects. 
because okay. the example I'm going to use is like, I made this awesome observation and now I want to share it. <laughs> so how do I find a project to share it with? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because I know a lot of the, the folks on the call obviously have, have used this in the past and have made observations previously to the project starting that are viable observations that they want to put into the project. So we'll wait for that then. Awesome. Okay. So that was a website. And we're going to talk about how to do how this process this. with the phone apps. Um, so once you have downloaded the app on your phone, you can actually sign up for an account directly through the app. Uh, generally, once you are in, though, it remembers you. So we're going to, and I apologize to those Android users out there if what you see on your phone looks different on mine. Um, I used to have an Android phone, so I took advantage of it for as long as I could to get those screenshots, but it's entirely possible that they're slightly outdated at this point. So my apologies if that is the case. But hopefully it will give you a sense that the two platforms look fairly similar, but there are a few places where things are a little bit different. So once you open up that app on your phone, um, another thing I want to say right off the bat is if you are out, you know, with your phone walking and you see that butterfly nectaring on that flower, open up the camera on your phone and take the picture. Don't waste time trying to get iNaturalist open. Just take the picture however you can. Take a video if that's easier, and then you can take a screenshot. But just get the picture. You can always go back in and pull stuff from your gallery. You don't have to take a picture through the iNaturalist app. So get the shot. I have unfortunately lost a lot of a lot of good nature observations that way by wrangling with the with the app to open rather than just going in and taking a picture. So once you're ready to add an observation, maybe it's of something you took a photo of a few minutes before, maybe it's you know a flower that you're ready to take a picture of, um, your app will actually uh, should keep you logged in. To make an observation, you'll see either this little camera icon or a plus button, and that will open up your camera or give you the option to go to your gallery. So you can either take a photo or begin pulling in photos from your gallery. And uh, for the sake of kind of simplicity, I'm only showing one photo that's added. Again, what you'll want to do is add as many photos as are appropriate or accessible to you that you can get um, into your observation. And so if you're in a place that actually has cellular connection or if you happen to be by some, you know, lucky chance at a place where you actually get Wi-Fi access, then that computer vision uh, identification suggestion will also work for you. If you're in a more remote area, that will not work and you may just have to put a placeholder in your uh, species ID if you're not sure what you're seeing. You can always go back and edit later. Uh, so in this case, it gave me, whoops, a suggestion for grass. And in fact, the first suggestion is accurate. Now that said, um, that computer vision process is great when it works, and it can be hilariously bad when it doesn't. So this is an actual, I have a couple of examples of these for my, this always happens to my husband. I'm not sure why, but I take full advantage of it. I'm, he's, I think he's getting tired of me being like, I need you to send me those screenshots because this is awesome. So this is an actual photo that uh, he took while we were out on a walk. This is, you know, just neighborhood in Austin. And probably most of you can get at least, you know, even if you're not a bird person, get a general sense of what this is. Three birds, right? They're actually black vultures. So when he loaded this photo into iNaturalist, this is what he got. Uh, it's, we're not really sure what this is, but here are our top 10 recommendations, starting with American black bear. Uh, my favorite on there is American bison. That would be an amazing thing to see, but alas, no. Now, uh, one of the things to note about this, and the reason I bring this up, is because we often have a tendency to, especially when we take photos through our phone, to just leave them as is, and that can often be problematic. I tend to have more kind of bad suggestions coming through when I do things on my phone than when I do with my camera, probably because I'm a little bit more diligent about editing things that come from my camera before I put them into the website. So if you end up with a situation like this, what my suggestion would be is to go, you know, uh, not really, go back into your, uh, into your photos 
and edit this down, crop it down. And that may actually be helpful. Another actual real-time example of this, again, from my husband's phone, um, he was at a neighbor's place and actually were, you know, having a great winter for these little birds, these pine siskins. So the photo that he took, he thought was going to work out okay. And you can actually see the, that same photo up here. We're not confident enough to make a suggestion. First thing it popped up was barn owl and then flying squirrel and then screech and a cat. And it's like, no, nah, not even close. So when he went in and actually cropped this just down to that image of the bird, the second thing that came up then was the appropriate species. Suddenly then the computer vision suggestion was a little, a little more able to handle it. Um, and I specifically asked him to do this um, just as a demonstration, even though like in this case, we knew what the species was. But if you didn't and you needed some additional suggestions or assistance, maybe it's an, a, you know, a kind of, um, a beetle that you want to try and narrow down its group a little bit better, then this is a process that can be very helpful. So a little tip and trick there. So that's so much for uh, getting photos in. If you want to add additional photos, you can go right back into that observation, hit the plus, takes you back to your camera or to your gallery, keep going until you've got what you need. You get your species identification or, you know, as close to some organism level that you can. Maybe it's flowering plant until you can get back to some place and look at a field guide. Uh, any notes that you need to make, you can do. It should pull in your time and date. If your GPS, it has, if you've given the app permission to access your location information, which you can do in the various settings in your phone, then it should also pull in location and it should also you, give you an accuracy. Uh, keep an eye on that accuracy because sometimes it can be very large and may actually place you in a location where you're not actually standing. So sometimes you may need to actually manually change that if it's uh, puts you maybe on the other side of a major street, which you can do in the app. You can also then go on and set a geo privacy setting if you need to. Again, open obscured or private tag it as either captive or cultivated. In the case of the either of these observations, they're both wild. So I say, nope, it is not captive or cultivated. And then the last, the last thing you can do is add it to a project directly. So when you click on this, again, what it will pull for you is just those projects that you have joined. And so you can select them. And the example I'm gonna use here on the Android with my loggerhead shrike, is I'm going to add that to Birds of Texas. And just like the Adopt-A-Loop project, we have a, a particular field that we ask people to fill out. So when you go into a project that has fields to be filled out, those should show up as well, and you can fill those out directly. So that'll be nested underneath the project on your phone. Um, so again, don't forget to fill out that special observation field uh, for the site number in the adopt -a loop project, and then you should be ready to go. So another kind of tip and trick with the phone apps, especially if you're out there doing some kind of serious observation or you're in a place where uh, location, your uh, GPS is having to work a little bit harder or your batteries run down, you can actually change a setting that gives you control over when the observations are uploaded to the platform. So this is something that I tend to keep as a default on my phone. The way that the app um, is defaulted to is to automatically start uploading those observations as you make them. Um, I like to bank mine in my phone, and this is what it will look like when you have it set up like that, is it will tell you how many observations you have to upload and then give you the option to do that. So to find that setting, you want to go to your menu on either Apple or Android. So it's the dial or what they call the hamburger, I believe, on Android. And you're looking for a setting, so it'll be under settings in Android, called automatic upload or auto sync. And you can turn that off. And what that does then is give you control over when those observations actually upload. So you can, uh, I've actually on my iPhone banked over 100 observations at a time get it back to a place where I can plug in my phone, connect it up to Wi-Fi, and then you only have to hit upload once and it will just start to work through those observations uh, in its own time. So you do not have to do that every single time. Just for one batch or for whatever batch it's got in there, you hit upload once and it will work through them. So 
any questions on the phone before we talk about how to take some of those old observations that you may have and add them into this project. All right, I got a question from Anne. Okay. I know you probably already covered this, but um, you're talking about all these different projects. I've been doing iNaturalist for about a year um, when we had somebody come and talk about the pro the iNaturalist project at a Texas Master Naturalist meeting. So, and I, so I've never, for a year I've been doing observations and putting where I see them and all that, but I've never joined a project, never shared any of my observations with a project. So could you review how we join a project? Yes, we are, we are about to talk about that right now. So thank you okay. for that perfect segue. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Lisa's got a, well, got a few coming in. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, this is more a question for Joshua. Um, you know, I have a lot of old, I mean, old photos and such from several of our sites. And I wonder how far back would you to go? I mean, last spring and summer, we've had you know, such an odd situation about when we could be out due to the COVID issue. But um, what about any further back than that? Um, how, how do you feel about adding those to the, your project in particular? I would call them archival things. Um, I'm not sure that Tanya, what do you think of on that as far as how far back the, the data would still be relevant for this project? So you may be asking the wrong person because my answer is pretty much going to be, give me all the data <laughs> That's all what the I time. <laughs> because what's nice if, if you're, when you go in, um, like for example, to update maps or something like that, or to add um, kind of the most current things, when you do the download and I'll, I trying to remember if I, I'm sorry, y'all. I've been working on like two or three different PowerPoints right now. So I'm trying to remember what slides are in which one. But what it'll basically do when we download data out of these projects is it spits it out as a CSV file, which we can then upload in or into Excel. So you can filter by date. So if there's a date beyond which you simply don't want to look at, you know, stuff from 10 years ago or even two years ago, then it's super easy to basically just filter that out of the data set. Um, but then the question is, would you ever potentially have a, you know, a motivation to look at what was seen at these sites 10 years ago? Personally, I think it doesn't do any harm to have that stuff um, yeah. added in there because we can always filter it out. Well, my, my older photos don't have a GPS on it. I would just only be able to identify it by the park. Um, the newer ones, I do have a G GPS on my camera. But this also relates to another question for Joshua. Um, how do you feel about us adding things to sites that are on the GTWT that we aren't necessarily, you know, I, I'm in the Edwards Plateau area, but mm -hmm. if I happen to have something because I went down to the valley, does it matter that I wasn't on um, working on the project down there? Do you mind if I go ahead and add my data in as I'm collecting such down there? Not at all. I think the like Tanya said, the, the more data we can have, even if it's not one of your specifically adopted sites, but it is a wildlife trail site. I think that's that's perfectly acceptable to to upload that data. Well, I was just sure other people might have that question too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Sharla had a question. Sorry, I didn't have my microphone off. Um, so I see the setting that you were talking about for the auto auto upload. Mm -hmm. Are you going to cover how you batch upload? Because I've never done that from Ooh. your phone. Ooh, you, you, you were can't. saying that. Oh, I thought I you, I thought I only heard see... you say that you kind of stacked them up and then you would come back and oh. uh, over Wi-Fi upload them. And yep. I didn't see see where you showed that. I might have missed it. Not a problem. Um, and this is where again, it's like I we have to rely on screenshots for the especially for the phone because there's like 
we don't have the whatever setup to show that. Gotcha. Um, so where it says, I don't know if y'all can see my mouse here, but where it mm. says one observation to upload, I've had okay. that say 119 observations to upload. Okay. And then it'll be this button right here that says the green button that says upload and you, you click that once. And what you'll see is then it'll show a little progress like this. Um, I'm pointing at the screen. Like y'all can see that, uh, all where it says here, this one observation that's kind of highlighted in green, it'll have however many highlighted in green. It'll show you the, the progress of each as it's going through. And when it's uploaded, then it becomes kind of this default background, white, gray, gotcha. whatever. Okay. So you can actually see how it's going through them in that batch that's that's saved. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, Anne, did you have another question? See your hand up. No, I okay. didn't. Okay, okay. All right, I think that's all the questions for now then. Perfect, okay. So let's talk about joining projects because of course that's you know kind of the prerequisite to getting stuff into these projects um so i'm going to use this example because i just i love this photo the series of photos this was like one of the one of my highlight mornings like there's just nothing like coming into this was actually pre pre parks and wildlife um but you know it's nothing like coming into work and seeing a beautiful western diamondback rattlesnake <laughs> um so this is actually you know, just a, a great observation. I'm super excited about it. And I want to put this observation to work for science. So I am looking at it right now on the website. And so as I scroll down, we'll see, yep, a whole bunch of people weighed in, they agree on the species. And so as you scroll down here, kind of under the side that has the map, you'll see a little tab for projects. And so I can click on that and it will show me all of the projects that I was a member of. And I'm looking at all of these and I'm just thinking none of these are actually the, a good fit for this observation. So I'm going to go find a project that I think this should be a part of. And I think that should be Herps of Texas. So I can go up to the top of the website and go to community and then projects. And that will actually take me to the projects page on the website. And I can go search for Herps of Texas. And so the first thing that will pop up is our Nature Trackers Herps of Texas project. And then I click on that and it will take me to the project page. So all of these traditional projects have kind of the general same layout. It's a little less um, refined looking. These were some, these are the original type of financials projects. The collection projects look just a little bit different. Um, so I know that this is something that if I want to add things, I need to join it. So at the very top of the banner, this tiny little blueprint right up here, it says join this project. I click on that. And if I want to find out more about who's part of the project, I can do that as well. I can see who the curators are. So maybe I'm concerned about who's seeing my, my information. I can find that out. So this is an abbreviated view. This is not what you see on the whole website. Um, I'm kind of picking some things. So I've gone in and I've clicked join this project. So there'll be information about the project and some of the terms and conditions and things like that. It will tell me who the managers and curators are for the project. And then I keep scrolling down. And then closer to the bottom, there is information. If you want to receive updates about the project, you can, I usually keep this unclicked because I get enough emails as it is. This box right here is very important. Do you want to make your private or obscured observation coordinates visible to project curators? So you have three options, but you really only have two if you're talking about one of our nature trackers project. And I believe this is also a prerequisite for the adopt the loop trail project as well. Um, you can say yes, but only if I add the observation myself or yes, no matter who adds the observation to the project. So if you've given permission for other people to add your observations to projects you've joined, for example, then if you say yes, people can see the private observations or private location information, no matter who adds it to my project, then that's okay too. And that's where that would be relevant. Um, so 
Just note, again, all of our Nature Trackers projects are set up to require that you share that location information. And as I said, I do also believe that the Adopt-A-Loop project is set up the same way as well. So before you've actually joined that project, you will have to make sure that you select one of those yes options. And then this is the one thing I've actually run into um, some people having issues with is they think they're done. But in reality, you got to go all the way down to the bottom of the join that join page and click that last blue button that says, yes, I want to join. Once you've clicked that, then you're part of the project. So I'm excited. I go back to my snake observation and I go back into my little projects menu. And now Herpsa Texas shows up under my projects. So now I can add it and I'll see it show up that I have joined that project. And there it is. And the other thing that it tells me is that there are observation fields associated with this project. So I can also click on that and fill in the various observation fields that are requested for this project. So in the case of Adopt-A-Loop, if you have some of these observations that are already in iNaturalist and you want to go in and add them to the project, then you can, this is how you would go about joining. We just talked about joining the project on the website. And then what you can do if you have like one or two you can go in and do this process of once you've joined, go into the drop down, select the project, and fill in the observation field. If you have multiple that you want to do, like maybe 10 or 15, then that's where you would go into your dashboard, go into the little observations tab, and click on that batch edit. And then you could actually add multiple observations to this project that way. And I don't have slides for that. If people want to see that, we can live demo that. I can try to live demo that a little bit later. Um, but in short, this is how that, pro that process works. You don't actually have to edit in order to add something to a project. It's just another setting that you kind of select for that given observation. So to do this on your phone, you can actually join projects to your phone as well. So you'll want to go to the menu where on iPhone, it'll say more, and on Android, it'll be under the main menu, and you're looking for projects. And then you can go in and search for the name of a project. And once you've pulled it up, then you can actually join it directly. It's one click to join from your phone. Um, so again, I just really wanna stress how important it is to look for those accuracy measures, whether it's checking it on your phone, or as we see on the other side of the screen here, um, checking it on the actual um, website, but that information is something that sometimes gets missed and it is actually really important for the work that we do. So before we kind of get to a little bit of a stopping place to take uh, a, a break and a data collection opportunity, do we have any other questions? No hands raised yet. OK, um, so we're going to we're about um, 408 or by the time I stop talking, it'll probably be about 410. Um, so that gives us a good amount of time. Uh, Joshua, did you have any thoughts about how long you wanted to kind of leave for any sort of discussion or Q&A or anything like that um, at the end or? Uh, I mean, probably just a few minutes. It seems like people are kind of chiming in with questions. So, okay, ten Cause... ten minutes or so, maybe. Okay, so That's let's sufficient. let's do um, let's do about what'll probably be about twenty minutes of break. So let's plan to be back at four thirty. But before you go, um, what I've kind of done is set up this a practice adopt a loop project. So Joshua, if you can take the link that I sent you earlier and just drop it into the chat for folks to be able to pull that up if they want to on their web browser, or if you're just using your phone, then what you would wanna go in and search for under projects is practice adopt a loop project. Well, this is our sandbox for today. It's not pretty, it's not you know fancy, um, but, this will give you an opportunity to go through that practice of joining a project and then whatever observations you make, it's all fair game. It can all go into here.
but I have gone and added that extra um, field that you'll need to fill out so you can have a little practice working with that as well. And that link is in the chat box now, and we just got a question from Mary. Mary, if you want to ask your question, you will need to unmute. No, I didn't have a question. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. OK, so and if if for some reason some of if you if any of you have any issues with um, with actually finding the project or joining it, we can talk about that and troubleshoot some of that, too. Um, but it is 410, so I'm going to stop screen sharing. So I don't know if you want to pause recording or something like that, um, but we will plan to start back up. I'm going to start going back into the next section, talking about how we edit observations um, at 430. Okay. We do so, have one more question that came into the chat box. Um, they found the adopt a loop, but how do I find my particular loop? Uh, we actually don't have it narrowed down quite that much. It's the observations are statewide for the project, but when you make the observation, there's a, a field that you'll have to fill out with the site name and number in it. And that was uh, Vicky. And then we do have a couple other questions. Do you want to take those real quick before we break? Or? Sure, yeah. Sure. Uh, let's see, Lisa had another question. All right, Joshua, can you explain um, the state parks, for example, a lot of the public places that are on the um, um, Great Texas Wildlife Trails, especially state parks, they have a collection type of account where, of course, my things go into automatically because I allow that. So what is the strategy or reasoning behind why you wouldn't just take the information they have from their collection in for your adopt a loop um, why you have something separate when they've already set up an account uh, a collection i i know that it's different because it's a collection and it's not this standard type that you have to join so could you uh maybe explain what the advantage for tpwd that is well, they, the wildlife trails, we have over 920 sites on the trails, so it's far more expansive than just the 80 so odd state parks that we have. Right, and and I did expect that that would be, a, a you know, a lot of these are like along the roadway, say, um, so that would not have had a collection anyway for it. So I can understand you doing it for it. It's just that it seems duplicative for places that we know we already have collections for. I guess that's fine. Yeah, and Tanya, you might just, be able to answer that a little bit better as far as, you know, species variants or, or different things. Sure. Well, again, um, let's say, so you would run into that issue, for example, if you are seeing species that are automatically obscured in iNaturalist. In those collection projects, we're not going to know precisely where they were seen. So that's one that's one issue that we run into with that type of project. Um, and the other thing that's really nice about the way that the traditional projects are set up is that we can also do trainings like this and kind of um, regulate who's we can kind of get a better handle on who's actually actively participating in this initiative. So with the collection projects, when we do things like City Nature Challenge, there are probably people who don't know they're participating in the City Nature Challenge who are putting, who are, whose observations are getting added in versus those people who are going out for the day and participating. So from the perspective of Parks and Wildlife and us also from our end, evaluating who's participating, this type of project gives us a better handle on that aspect of it too, which is in addition to the biological parts. Um, but yeah, there's that challenge of, you know, what's actually 
considered a part of the wildlife trail and it's it's incredibly diverse and so we actually did have a lot of back and forth discussion about what would be the best fit for this particular uh, type of initiative thank you sure let's see shelly yes when i added the practice uh, project for today and then I went back to my projects. It looked like my phone had lost all the projects. I did close the app and reopen it and everything reappeared. But for a minute there, I thought everything was gone. So if, and my friend here did the pretty much the same thing happened with her phone and I have an Android and she's got an iPhone. So, oh, wow. yeah. So, um, yeah, if you're having that, if anybody else is having that problem, just totally close the app and reopen it and and it did reappear but uh it gave me a little bit of a heart attack here for a second <laughs> yeah well thank you for that tip so no I one else has, has a heart attack <laughs> all right uh bill yeah i'm uh adding a picture with the phone app and when i open the practice adopt a loop project it says place of observation site number. Where do we get those site numbers? So that will be in the actual adopt a loop project. Uh, each each site along that loop that you're looking at will have a site number assigned to it. Ah, okay. So, so for if, today, just use one. Yeah, you could just put something, you know, a random thing in there for today. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Yeah, that's. <laughs> But yeah, when you visit the actual sites for the the real project, you know, you'll put in like Heart of Texas East site number 45. And that will let us know precisely where the, the observation was made. All right, um, Donna. Um, so what if you're at you know one or more of these sites and you have a friend with you who is helping you to um, observe and document things uh, so they're taking photos but they're not technically part of this project but but are um, uh, you know have used iNaturalist before can they just add this project and 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 submit the observations are do I somehow have to get them? How how do I use someone who's helping me, I guess? I mean, yeah, I guess in order to upload the photos to the project, they would have to be a member of the project. Um, we're, we're hoping to maintain it to the master naturalist, so I don't know if the best way would be for them to share the photos with you and allow you to upload it. That way we're not running into, you know, having an abundance of project members that aren't part of the master naturalist program yeah but if they're texas master naturalist and use i naturalist then they can just add the project and submit them directly yes okay okay which would be the case for me okay um uh, charlotte did you have another question yes i did um I was looking at something else, and again, I joined this late today, so y'all might have said this, but I was reading through some emails, and it said that for birds, we're supposed to use eBird. Is that correct? We don't use iNaturalist? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and a lot of the, the places should have eBird hotspots already. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, just want to be sure about that. Thank you. Yep. Are y'all going to have training on eBird at all? That's a possibility. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll discuss it. Because this was really nice. I really have enjoyed this, and your presentation's great. been great. So if we could do that as well, because I haven't used eBird that much either, that would help a this lot. This stuff is all all oh, new to me as well. So you welcome to the rabbit hole. Are you? Ready? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm more of a birder than a plant person, so that'll be fun. Okay. <laughs> this is you. always this is always one of those questions that we get for those of y'all that are still hanging here. Yeah. You know, like the, the I I feel like there's this collective gasp 
when we talk about birds and iNaturalist and the way that I look at the two platforms, eBird and iNaturalist is they're complements to each other. And that for people who don't know birds very well, iNaturalist is a fantastic learning tool because if you manage to get a photo of something or a sound recording, you have a community there that can help you learn. And so I would love to see a continuum of people who, because I'm always recruiting for team bird. I'm a bird. So (laughs) Um, so I'd love to see this kind of continuum of people who learn maybe using iNaturalist and then graduate on to eBird when they feel comfortable enough to really fill in those checklists because those checklists are phenomenally powerful. That's where we get the population information because we can get the numbers. So again, eBird is one of those databases that we go to when we need population data, when we need numbers. Um, the other thing that iNaturalist is really nice for as a complement to eBird is if we're talking about bird habitat. This is where we get that information because we can get that context of what kind of plants are present in the area, what kind of insects are being seen in that same area, you know, what is kind of the larger picture that we aren't getting from right. eBird data alone. So I think they can really work well together, uh, but neither is, is a replacement for the other. Absolutely. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Great, thanks. So we do have some other questions, some other folks with their hands raised. Do we want to go ahead and hold on those so we can get a few observations to go through that and then we can come back to those questions after? I think that's a good idea because I think we'll still need to come back and restart at 4.30 just to, re- to make sure that yeah. we can clear, you know, whoever needs to take off at five. Um, right. but, but yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, if you guys want to keep your hands raised, we can come back to the questions after. And then if we want to want to break and make some observations. And be back at 430, Tanya. 430. All right. We'll see you guys back in 10 minutes.